Well, good afternoon. I am Dwight Ford, the Executive Director of Project Now, and you have just tuned in to another episode of Rooting Out Poverty, Planting Seeds of Opportunity. And of course, we've adjusted our schedule. Maybe you're with us for the very first time, and this isn't normally over your lunch hour where you are able to, from there, 12 to 1. But we've adjusted our schedule purposely so that we could be with a very special guest today and have a in-depth conversation about something that I believe is at the heart of our humanity in the Quad Cities, I dare say our states, um, but even more importantly, the world. And so we're gonna have a conversation about um, a very important topic today. But before I do that, I want to uh, at least get a chance to talk to you about uh, the lineup for this year. If you were with us last year, you would know that we introduced our five pillars that help us to root out poverty. And we talk extensively about education, economics, healthcare, housing, and justice. This year, of course, we take those pillars and we're going to expand them. We're gonna walk through them uh, at great length and we're going to do our best to be able to equip, make more information known to the public. We're organizing daily around these four, uh, five pillars rather, and we are doing the things that really matter for our community and the three county service delivery area that Project Now has a commitment of serving. That's Henry County, Mercer County, and Rock Island County. Uh, with that said, uh, today we're talking about justice uh, and we're gonna keep our commitment of justice throughout the entirety of the month of January. Uh, why shouldn't we? It's also the month that we uh, remember and to commit to causes of justice in the uh, great legacy of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr who was assassinated uh, and uh, that legacy still remains with us of what we should be doing. And for some people ask, well, what does justice have to do with poverty? I would always say listen, everything, um, the whole hopes that we could have a just and fair society has everything to do with poverty. We like to say around here that justice is love dressed in work clothes. And so we have our work clothes put on today and we got a lot of work to do and I'm glad you're with us in journeying. If you have not had a chance already, share this broadcast with somebody, uh, send them a quick message, share the broadcast. We would love for you to do it. Uh, and let's have a good conversation. There are always time for you to put a comment up. This is an interactive session. We'll do our best to see your comments and we will always do our best to field your questions. And so with that said, uh, today's guests are from a wonderful initiative organization that has far-reaching uh, capacity uh, throughout the two-state reality that we share here, and that is breaking traffic. And so our guest today is uh, Supervisor Gretchen. Glad to have you with us today, Gretchen. Yes, thank you. And we have two advocates uh, that are close to the work. They're going to be able to give us a good feel for what the work really looks like on the ground and how this work uh, is being uh, uh, facilitated in the lives of people that need their assistance the most. And that's Sarah and Tyler. Glad to have you both with us. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having us. Yeah. All right. So now let's get right into it. You know, these conversations go so fast, uh, but I want to kind of set the stage before we start talking about some of the realities of uh, your commitments here and to kind of give the flush uh, of understanding to uh, breaking traffic and its organizational value to so many people. I wanna get a hold of the language. When we say trafficking, uh, particularly on this day, as we are uh, remembering that today is also January 11th and for so many reasons, people all over the world are standing up, speaking out, speaking up, doing what they can, as today is Sex Trafficking Awareness Day. Now, we talk about trafficking, I would probably say it's an umbrella term, but let's find a way to kind of give at least a working definition so we're using language that everyone can join. Maybe they've never heard of trafficking or sex trafficking as a definition, or maybe they're joining us today because they want to know more. Gretchen, can you kind of help unpack all of this and give us a great working definition so we can lay a solid foundation for our discussion? Yeah, definitely. Um, with Human Trafficking Awareness Day, it's not only awareness of sex trafficking, but labor trafficking as well. 
um, with the federal definition, human trafficking is defined as participating in a venture to recruit, harbor, transport, supply provisions, or obtain a person for any of the following purposes. That would be for forced labor or service that results in involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery, and the commercial sexual activity through the use of force, fraud, or coercion, except if that person is under the age of 18, there doesn't need to be force, fraud, or coercion proven under federal law to have it be charged as human trafficking. Um, human trafficking is also knowingly purchasing or attempting to purchase services involving commercial sexual activity from a victim or another person engaged in sex trafficking. Wow. So we take trafficking or human trafficking and kind of start thinking about sex trafficking, the exploitation um, that is in labor trafficking, and we can probably get a real good understanding why uh, low-income and impoverished families and individuals are at additional risk. Uh, by no means do we want to suggest that only individuals who are low-income are vulnerable or at risk, but there is a natural uh, additional uh, kind of set of challenges that come with being uh, maybe a person that's experiencing homelessness, an individual essentially that has uh, familial needs and they, can, they have been promised that if they do this work, they'll be paid or wooed into the reality and it becomes something totally different where exploitation, coercion and force are part of that. Um, let's, take, let's take a step at that. So are these intersecting realities or... And what are we kind of feeling here in the Quad Cities? Or does all of these variations show up here in the Quad Cities? And that's for both advocates and uh, for Gretchen as well. I do think there is a strong correlation with poverty and human trafficking. Um, I think that many vulnerabilities are present if someone um, is experiencing poverty um, and it, other vulnerabilities that do occur um, with human trafficking could be a previous history of abuse or neglect. Um, those are very common. It's 70 to 90% of victims of sex trafficking have had a previous history of sexual abuse. So it is very common for that to be a vulnerability and factor. Well, thank you so much, Tyler, your experience. Are you seeing the kind of merging in of realities uh, is one, at least in this area, from the, your experience, more dominant? Your thoughts on this? Yeah, one thing that we talk about when we are giving trainings, um, whether in professional settings or in schools, is when you're seeing some of these vulnerabilities and you're seeing some of these kind of red flags that you often see when in regards to human trafficking, you know, just one vulnerability doesn't necessarily mean that someone is going to be trafficked or going to be targeted or going to, you know, experience some type of violence. But when you start to see the intersections of, you know, poverty, homelessness, substance use, family instability, um, community violence, um, mental health struggles, um, lack of a support system, right? Poverty, um, serves to exacerbate some of those vulnerabilities that might already exist. So, and they kind of tend to exacerbate each other and create a heightened sense of vulnerability for people who are experiencing those. Well, you mentioned that, uh, that a very important phrase, support networks and kind of think through what does it mean? Um, in your experience, Sarah, uh, working with individuals that are survivors or that are currently uh, in the throes or entrapped in a certain set of circumstances that is, in fact, um, trafficking. Uh, what are you seeing out there and uh, maybe those vulnerabilities and, and how you manage those vulnerabilities as you work with groups that are interested to help, but also help to pull individuals out of this um, sincere detriment of life itself? Yeah, so um, I, I actually am pretty new to family resources and breaking traffic. Um, I'm still learning, still learning. Yes. And so your learning experience, what has been some of the, the things that you have taken to heart in coming into that? First of all, let me say thank you, because I know anyone that you unites with breaking traffic and the 
uh, family resources uh, as a whole, as an entity, does it out of a heart commitment, uh, a sense of uh, capacity that you bring with education, experience, and expertise, and that you're there to uh, live the mission, so to speak. What are some of the important things that you're learning about trafficking here? Um, so there's, um, I know that we are survivor led and trauma informed. And so, um, right now I'm in the training process of, um, learning about the tra different traumas. And, um, I haven't actually been able to work one-on-one -on -one with survivors yet, but that'll be pretty soon. Well, we salute that effort and we know that the importance of training really does sharpen a set of tools and allow you to move with a certain set of understanding. So we're excited about your process. And uh, you made a couple of very important points uh, about the training. And we'll talk a little bit about those individuals that are interested in coming along as partners or maybe uh, additional advocates for the work that can stand alongside and, and press and push for the things that are meaningful in the everyday mission attainments that you work toward. I, I want to kind of work through some of the, we see this all the time in poverty and uh, that there is a, a rash of misconceptions, misinformation, misnomers, um, and probably simply bad uh, understandings that have taken advantage uh, of the, uh, the most vulnerable people at the worst time in their life. What are some of the misnomers and the misunderstandings and misinformation that goes out, at least for poverty, you know, that they they put themselves in this situation, that it's all uh, just personal responsibility. They People tend to make poverty a moral failure, something they didn't do right, and that a person could actually be working 60 hours a week and still be impoverished. What are some of the, the characters or the... Uh, injurious misunderstandings that are in your field. Yeah, um, I just wanted to circle back a little bit because Sarah has done amazing work um, in the past with doing outreach um, with the Chicago Dream Center and yes. um, has done like street outreach and everything, working with survivors there. So she's not totally new to the field, but yes, with family resources and breaking traffic, she is. And we're so happy to have her. Now, thank you for saying that. Hold that thought. I'm coming right back to you, Gretchen. Thank you, because that work is so important. You're new to family resources and the team here, but you're not new to the work and the mission of breaking uh, trafficking and dismantling systems. So thank you so much, Gretchen, for mentioning that. And Gretchen, the misnomers that we were talking about? Yeah, a lot of times um, people think that um, people are like kidnapped or there's a lot of violence going on um, for someone to be trafficked, but it could just be that they have been so manipulated and with that coercion or fraud um, and they could have threats against them or their family, but they may not have been physically assaulted or something of that nature. Um, but they're like similar to Stockholm syndrome. Um, victims can be very manipulated um, and coerced to do these types of acts. And um, is, I just think that a lot of people think it's just someone getting kidnapped or taken overseas. And um, another like thing that I've heard a lot is that it just happens to girls or women, but actually 50% um, of the survivors of trafficking are male. So that's another misconception that is very often um, thought of, as well as um, people not really relating human trafficking to the labor trafficking. And there are statistics that uh, for every one survivor of sex trafficking, there are nine survivors of labor trafficking worldwide. So it is a very prevalent issue that needs to be talked about more. Well, I am so glad that you took the time to unpack that. Uh, particularly what people would tend to understand or choose to believe about uh, trafficking as a whole, that it's um, a level of violence that is pal uh, that is uh, non-palatable, that people can see, and that it's uh, swollen eyes or something of that matter. And it may not show up like that at all. 
Um, it may show up uh, with the person that um, that you end up seeing in the grocery store once a week uh, that they could be in fact uh, trafficked. Uh, the, the truth is as well that 50%, who would have known if you're not in the industry and looking at these numbers, because um, just like so many other realities that in America, we have a tendency to genderize certain challenges. And uh, so we kind of lock a reality into place based on gender and 50% uh, is uh, no small number. It's, it's half the population. Uh, so when we start thinking through that and what does that mean that half of uh, the uh, survivors and those that are experiencing the victimization and exploitation of trafficking are essentially men. Uh, that should warrant another set of commitments from the public as a whole. A little earlier, uh, Sarah, we talked about the support networks. What we find in poverty, that poverty has a tend tendency to separate and segregate, separate individuals um, from uh, the resources uh, and from families and the kind of the village that kind of helps individual get uh, out of certain uh, challenges or help with the decision making process as they are trying to figure out what's the next move. We also see the segregation from resources and the networks that would allow a sense of um, um, kind of value system for a person. And when a person um, just reading lightly through some of the statistics in the field that you work in daily, that those experiencing homelessness, the number of those that may be um, LGBTQIA uh, community that are in this uh, reality as well. Uh, that idea of separation and segregation uh, from networks, how do, you, how, do you, how do you get in and disturb that when it has a tendency to pull away from, and we talked about the Stockholm Syndrome a little earlier as well, and that's mental. Uh, and it has physical ramifications, but it's really a, a mental effort to put a person in a certain position where they don't see uh, a way out or they see the person that's causing the most injury as someone that's concerned about them. Sure. So um, I, I gather, um, I think just talking with the person, I think acknowledging and um, I, I think that it's crucial that they would have mentors or someone that would be willing to listen. And also to be, I think it's very crucial to be trained in it so that you can ask those questions and um, be able to support that individual. Um, a lot of times they, um, they don't have anyone to talk to or they feel like they don't. And so I think it's just crucial um, that people would come alongside of them, whether it be a teacher or, um, an advocate, a mentor, um, or just, you know, different family members to be involved and ask those questions and just really come along inside and support them. I'm so happy you mentioned that. Sometimes the most humane thing we can do is ask a person a question because it, it, it shows in many ways that they are here. They're not invisible, that one cares to ask a set of questions. As uh, Tyler, as you go into schools or with organizations, what are some of the questions do you that you ask out loud and kind of help individuals to think through this process or to start the uh, the kind of connections being made so that they are not more at risk or they can think about their friends, their colleagues that may be just as susceptible to some of these um, these vulnerabilities as well. One thing that I focus on a lot, especially in schools, is um, the social media aspect. Um, you know, the nature of trafficking, you know, Gretchen mentioned that we a lot of times misconstrue it as like a kidnapping kind of relationship. But the reality is that those victims are groomed and they're manipulated and they're manipulated based off of their relationships with their traffickers. And a lot of times the ways that we're connecting with people in this digital world is through social media. So really emphasizing social media safety um, as much as possible, asking kids, how many of you have public profiles? How many of you are sharing your locations? How many of you 
know every single one of your Facebook friends? Um, how well do you know them? What types of information are you putting out there? And really trying to get people thinking about, you know, who has access to their information and who they're building relationships with and um, what sort of the red flags might be in those relationships. Well, social media, when you start thinking about that entirety, the entirety of the world of social media, and uh, sometimes, of course, uh, parents in the best commitments that they have, uh, they feel so like um, intimidated because the fact that they can't be everywhere at the same time and and know what their child or um, their daughter or son may be engaging into and who they're connecting with. Uh, so the very fact that you are asking them to consider is such a helpful note to help them also think about what it is that they're doing at this time. I, I am so glad. Maybe we'll come back uh, to that and put a pin here for it. But I want to come back to what type of offerings do we have for parents, uh, for communities, for uh, civic organizations, for faith institutions to really get the kind of conversations uh, that are needed to continue the disruption and hopefully uh, with our effort, the elimination of trafficking here. Uh, so that's kind of our commitment is to find ways that we can get more people involved. And uh, when I say involved, of course, I'm talking about at whatever level that they can start and take another step forward. Gretchen, your, your commitment has been to think through and supervise uh, the effort. What is it that people should know about the history of breaking traffic and its current mission. How did it get started? I think this will be a great opportunity now that we've defined, we've kind of walked through some of the vulnerabilities and we're at a point now that I believe it will be so advantageous to the viewing audience to learn about the rich uh, legacy and the great commitment that you have and this explicit understanding of your mission. Yeah, definitely. Um, former Iowa Senator Maggie Tinsman created Breaking Traffic in 2008, and it was dedicated to eradicate sex trafficking in the Quad Cities area um, of Iowa and Illinois. And the main focus of Breaking Traffic when it was first created was to provide education, legislative advocacy, and community partnerships. Um, in 2012, the Breaking Traffic um, Merge, or they didn't merge with Family Resources until 2016, but they formed a collaborative partnership with Family Resources in 2012. And then in 2016, they merged. So then in 2016, they were able to provide advocacy services to survivors instead of just provide that education and awareness in the community. I love the fact that you uh, mentioned the community partners, that it was by design. And of course, Project Now and all of our partners that work closely with us in areas of domestic violence and other social needs that we partner with. We think the world of family resources and breaking traffic. And so we're so proud to be able to say we partner in this work and we do what we can do to aid the effort of eradicating uh, trafficking in the two state uh, area. So we're so happy to hear that, that it's education, the sense of legislation, that, that whole role of advocacy and how important that is. One of the things that um, you mentioned about the legislation, that it started with that as an intent. We say here, actually, um, the whole understanding that poverty is not just simply a bad set of decisions from an individual or character flaws, that um, many of the activists uh, and advocates in our field suggest in no uncertain terms that poverty is a policy choice, that there's no way to eliminate the causes of poverty without taking a serious delve into policies that restrict, hinder, or limit uh, the agency of an individual to be able to take advantage of the opportunities before them. So part of that is policy. We've been working with fully free the uh, statewide initiative in Illinois to, to deal with the permanent punishments that are on the books of the, um, uh, of the state of Illinois that restrict an individual once they come out of prison, having served their time, 
uh, that they are still limited in educational opportunities, uh, employment opportunities, and housing. Now, how can a person take advantage of the opportunities that are before them as an individual that has been released when there are permanent punishments, punishment, permanent punishments turn into uh, a reality of the permanency of poverty, which is not just simply lower in economic class, it is the establishment of a caste system that is very hard to break. And then we talk generational poverty. Th that commitment, the reason I mentioned policy is because we take a look at policies. We try to find a way to be always in dialogue with public uh, policy makers. One third of our board by design is public elected officials. Uh, what are some of the ways po policy has helped and maybe even perhaps uh, talk about some of the policies that we need to break trafficking. Um, let's get a good conversation about legislation and how does that work with you? Yeah, um, so Family Resources does get funding from the Iowa Attorney General's Office of Crime Victims Assistance Division. Sorry, can't okay. speak. Um, and that has helped. We are asking for more funding for victim services so that we can provide more client assistance funds and things like that. And in Illinois, um, we're funded through the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Abuse. Mm -hmm. um, so having it, those funders help us provide services to survivors is crucial. Um, and the, in Illinois, they have the Safe Harbor Act where someone under the age of 18 cannot be charged with prostitution. Um, in Iowa, we are advocating that they enact the Safe Harbor Act so that that would protect um, any survivors from getting those charges if they're under the age of 18. Wow. Uh, thank you for mentioning the Safe Harbor Act and, of course, uh, that it uh, has been established uh, with um, within proximity to Iowa. We sincerely hope that there are some additional opportunities for funding that legislators who may be watching would reach out and have additional conversations or welcome a conversation uh, with you as both supervisor and advocates to be able to come in and have additional uh, conversations about what the possibilities are. I know that the work that we do is uh, facilitated greatly by uh, funding, of course, uh, and also policies that have helped. Uh, the fact that we can serve up to 200% of the federal poverty level with certain programming, that changes the world. That means more people that were on the edge now qualify. The fact that we can go up to 125% um, of the federal poverty level with certain uh, commitments that we have changes the world for some families that would have been out of the income bracket. So policy always plays a major part we talked a little bit about the personal responsibility aspect because our our stool of um, kind of uh, support in this work is a three-legged stool. Personal responsibility, what we can do, and of course you mentioned earlier about taking a look for those that are on social media, how much am I sharing? Uh, how much do I really need to put myself out there in these areas? Am I becoming more vulnerable to certain realities and not knowing, not knowing it? Uh, just like in, in the case of those families experiencing poverty, that there's a personal responsibility. But so much of the uh, uh, world thinks that personal responsibility alone will change everything. It won't. Matter of fact, people always want to know what are poor people doing for themselves, mostly everything. That's my response. And that's why it's so hard to get out of poverty. Your social networks are small. You're not, you're not working with people that could pass your name on. You're not in dialogue with individuals because you've been separated and segregated from individuals that could take a serious look at your resume, give you a chance when you've been out of the work environment for over five years without ridiculing you and making it a judgment upon your character. All of those have to do with you doing it in tandem and in cooperation and partnership with someone else. Mostly uh, individuals that are trapped uh, are going to need somebody's help. They're going to need additional hands reaching in. And if they are able by their own uh, uh, ingenuity, uh, their own strength, a force to get out of it, they're going to need help in recovery. They're going to need help 
and taking another step once they get on the other side as a survivor. So we mentioned public, uh, rather the personal responsibility, public policy. And then final one, I wanna kind of talk about this three-legged stool of public will. How, how much of the public, when you go out to talk, uh, and both of the advocates and your experiences and past, um, public will, what, what do you desire the public to do once hearing these messages? Um, is there a particular group that we don't talk to as much that you want to make a plea toward today and say, well, we would love to have more conversations with these type of organizations. I want to make sure that we are throwing or casting a very wide net to bring additional team members or folks that are equally impassioned about eradicating trafficking, human trafficking in this area. Yeah, that's a great question. We do work with attacking trafficking mm -hmm. in the Quad Cities. They're um, another nonprofit organization that anyone can be a part of. Um, we do work with Rotary Clubs as well, doing presentations with them. Um, anyone can contact us if they want to get more information about how they can volunteer their time and help family resources. Um, so we just want everyone to raise awareness um, by sharing videos like this or um, posting things to raise awareness, especially during this month for human trafficking. And um, I can include my email after this as well, if anyone would like to reach out to me. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. We already have a couple of questions. We're gonna just ask the public and the viewing audience to uh, keep launching those questions. We're going to get to them just in a moment. And then we're going to have a good conversation with the viewing audience so we can hear from the subject matter experts as well. I spent some time in the uh, legislative halls in Nebraska and Lincoln, and I happened to walk by the chambers of the Nebraska Supreme Court on this very beautiful wood grain wall and the desk is there, are there and the layout is picturesque. They had these words that I never forgot. It's from the uh, the Greek uh, uh, mind and uh, philosopher Heraclitus. It says that when, uh, eyes and ears are poor witnesses when the soul is barbarous. And I never forgot that quote. Eyes and ears are poor witnesses when the soul is barbarous. And it told me that regardless of what a person hears or sees, if they have become callous to the reality of poverty or trafficking. Uh, one writer said that indifference is the offense that makes angels cry. When a person is indifferent to this reality, but this sex trafficking, labor trafficking, human trafficking affects all of us, doesn't it? As an advocate, I would love to hear from the advocates, your, your thoughts on this, doesn't this affect all of us? Yes, it absolutely does. Um, you know, and I think something huge when it comes to preventing human trafficking, right, stopping it before it ever starts is to take those steps to prevent those vulnerabilities and not becoming indifferent to the poverty that we see, not becoming indifferent to the discrimination that um, the LGBT community faces, not becoming um, indifferent to people who use substances um, and to those things that contribute to a person's vulnerability. You know, going back to social media, right? Everybody shares on social media, but not becoming indifferent and in that everybody does it mindset um, and really just keeping our fingers on the pulse of what's going on in our world and what we can do to um, mitigate some of the risks that people experience. I, I love that response. Thank you so much, because part of it is uh, your commitment to advise us. How do we prevent this? How do we start paying attention to what is there? And so if we can start with rooting it out early and planting more seeds of opportunity, providing more supports to people that are already vulnerable in life uh, and figuring out how do we expand the network uh, that keeps people from falling through the cracks the role of an advocate seems like it's a, a lot of different things uh, at one time. And uh, I know that, uh, Sarah, you're new to this uh, agency and its commitments, but in your past work, 
what did your day look like? What is it? Is it calling individuals? Is it working with those that are survivors? Is it a combination working and breaking down? Is it working with law enforcement? Um, kind of, kind of give us a feel for a person who says, maybe I think I'm drawn to do what Sarah is doing now. I maybe I would like to become an advocate and work in this field. What does it look like? What does it feel like? Yeah, so um, some of the work that I've done in the past would be um, a, is really um, one of the biggest things is listening and um, mm -hmm. support and it'd be mentoring. Um, um, that's all I can think of right now. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, um, so the role of listening, just just being present with people and having a chance to uh, to hear them out completely. Sometimes we're in conversation with people and we realize that when we finished, we did 90% of the talking and it was a, a one way uh, kind of uh, conversation. And if you could use the word conversation, but just listening, I think there are cues and clues that one picks up, if not to find out where they are at that particular point, but also start to put together the tapestry that is needed to look at the fabric uh, of their life and humanity to think about next steps as well. Mm -hmm. That sense of being present. And Tyler, how about with you, just being present? How, how big of a role does that uh, mean to people that may be experiencing uh, trafficking caught in it currently or those that have survived? It's huge. You know, I talked earlier about grooming and how, you know, a lot of trafficking victims are controlled through manipulation. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of work personally to unlearn for survivors. And so to be uh, just a person who listens to them as they work through that and who reminds them that, you know, what they experienced isn't their fault, that, um, you know, that we believe them when they tell us their stories. Um, and just to be that support person for whatever they need, whether it's, you know, housing assistance, whether it's referrals to community resources like yourself, or whether it's, um, you know, just someone to work through that emotional trauma that they've experienced, um, really just walking alongside them with whatever they are needing at the time. Well, you mentioned, thank you so much. You mentioned trauma. Uh, I, I've always said that poverty is a public health crisis because inside of it, people are exposed to traumas uh, at a high rate, an additional rate. Um, their children uh, and their families are traumatized by certain realities in poverty. Trauma takes a while to work through, sometimes a lifetime. Uh, Gretchen, after uh, you've been in this work, when individuals are, um, do we use the term rescued or uh, relief oh, broken? I don't how, think how do what term do we use when they're pulled out or when they give us the right language to use? Yeah, I wouldn't really say rescued. Um, I would say supported, supported. by an Thank advocate, um, and that it is definitely survivor led. Um, I was an advocate for four years before I stepped into the supervisor role with breaking traffic. Mm -hmm. So some of the other things that we do as an advocate is um, work with law enforcement. We have worked with law enforcement. We can be present at the law enforcement interviews with survivors. Um, we go to court with them and be the support person that they need um, during that hard time. We also work on safety planning. If there's any um, factors that are going on that they need to plan around, um, we help with that, we also help with housing needs, um, food. We have um, a shelter with family resources and we provide uh, transitional housing. The National Sheltered Alliance is an amazing resource um, for anyone who is involved with survivors. Um, they can apply there and they will be connected to several transitional housing programs across the United States. Um, I've used it several times for survivors and have heard amazing things after they've completed the transitional housing programs. Wonderful. Thank you for the use of language as well. We want to get it right. Uh, we want to use language as one of the ways you dignify individuals 
uh, and the idea of being supported through it uh, and uh, having those realities. Do you find that people, uh, the individuals that you have supported through the emancipation process of coming out of those really ugly experiences, do they stay connected to you uh, for a while? Uh, I'm touching based on this idea of trauma again. Uh, do you find that they want to be a part of the network of breaking traffic and to give testimony, uh, to be present with certain legislators, with law enforcement? Do you find that they kind of journey with you after those experiences? Yeah, it just depends on the person. Um, yeah. I've had survivors that do stay in touch and others that don't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then there are ways that survivors can get involved more um, with like the Elevate program. It's uh, Rebecca Bender, a survivor herself created that and it provides courses that survivors can take to learn more about yeah starting their own nonprofit or doing public speaking and getting compensated for speaking about their journey and their story. And I do believe that survivors should be compensated to talk about like the traumas in their life and give education yeah. and, you know, as they are a public speaker and um, it is great to raise awareness and things, but there's like the survivor Alliance as well, which is worldwide um, that, survivors can join and get connected with other survivors, um, attending conferences, and those used to be in person, but have been over Zoom yeah. Yeah. recently. Hopefully it'll be more in person soon. You know, Martin Berg said, the principal suffering of the poor is shame and disgrace. Uh, and I'm sure uh, as we work with individuals, uh, one third of our board is the client uh, or the the individuals that we serve, sometimes the, the language is client and other times the industry has gone back and forth with customer and things of that matter. Try not to put an individual into a certain bracket, but the individuals that we serve, uh, those individuals, of course, we work with over a period of time and we're always sensitive that if they do not want to be an activist or an advocate in the work right now, that's understood. When we work with returning citizens, men and women returning from incarceration, we understand that sometimes just being home is enough right now. Uh, they don't want to be out in the front or uh, to lead a protest. They just want to get their feet under them. However, when they are able to speak, they help to rid so many others of the shame and disgrace that uh, their experiences sometimes heap upon them with misunderstandings from the public. Uh, and it does a world of good when people hear directly from what we say directly impacted people. Your thoughts on that? I definitely think it is powerful for survivors to come forward and share their stories and uh, become vulnerable. It takes a very strong person to be able to do that. Um, yeah, so it absolutely does. And so it takes a strong person to have those, have those experiences in the past and come out and go through the rebuilding process. So, um, not only does it take strength to speak up, it takes strength to just be, um, mm -hmm. and to manage life and one's thoughts and, and hopes for the future. Uh, we're at a point now where we can take a couple of questions and we'll go to our producer and and say, uh, let's put some of the questions up and we'll kind of have a continued conversation. And then we'll come back and hear from the subject matter experts again in a different way. If we have a question that's ready, we can hear from him. There we go. Don Clark has a question. How does breaking traffic connect with these individuals? I'm guessing that they don't just come to you. Do people call to alert you to suspicious uh, interactions? Do the police have a role in identifying these victims? So I can answer that one, Gretchen, if you want to take a break. Um, okay. so we have a Family Resources has a 24-7 crisis line that anyone can contact. Um, we do also get referrals from law enforcement, from the hospitals, from our community partners um, that we do professional trainings with. Um, we get, you know, self-disclosures. Um, we provide crisis intervention. 
um, in person to the emergency rooms in cases of human trafficking, sexual assault, or domestic violence. So um, we can connect with people in that way as well. Great. So they come from various uh, vantage points, uh, and it seems like some are perhaps referred, others to their own um, agency may reach out to you, and and then other times it's uh, on a suspicious call or someone saying, I think something is going on in this. Sounds like individuals that are uh, experiencing uh, this very d difficult and horrendous reality reach out or, or individuals that may know of it kind of share the information. So I'm so glad that there are individuals that are not overlooking certain things that are paying attention to the details. And I'm so happy for those that are able to find a way to communicate that I am, I am in a situation that uh, is taking from me my humanity. And I'm so glad to hear that that communication lines can still be open. Uh, let's take another question. Porter McNeil is watching. In addition to the nonprofit leadership represented by uh, your experts today, what can governing bodies, city councils, uh, county boards, state legislatures, Congress do to help reduce this problem? In Illinois, what, what role does the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services play in monitoring this crisis? For example, thank you. A very informative session. He gives a, a very uh, very tender shout out to your uh, your expertise in the field. Thank you, Porter. So for what government can do, um, I mean, our legislative priorities for family resources, like I mentioned earlier, is to get the funding increase for victim services. Um, so that is something that they can help with. Um, and then the second part of the question, is there any way to bring it back up? I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, uh, in Illinois, what is, the, what is the role of Illinois Department of Children and Family Services? Um, do you want to mention that, Tyler? Yeah. So um, okay. I'm, I actually work on our Illinois team um, yeah. serving Rock Island, Henry, and Mercer counties. And I've had um, the great privilege to provide a lot of professional trainings this past year um, to DCFS, to Bethany, to the Center for Youth and Family Solutions, um, and really kind of anyone who works in child welfare because there tends to be um, some correlation between children who are experiencing those vulnerabilities and children who are being targeted for human trafficking. Um, in addition to um, DCFS and other child welfare organ fair organizations, I've pre presented to housing organizations, to um, substance use centers, to um, churches, to healthcare staff, to um, kind of across the board, really anyone that any organization where someone might seek support, we want them to have this information and to have our contact information so that if they aren't equipped to um, handle some of the advocacy pieces, they know where they can connect that survivor with um, the resources that they need. Great. Thanks for the question, Porter. It got, uh, it got us into the pipeline for another set of questions, particularly with uh, presentations. Uh, is there an opportunity for Breaking Traffic to present at the Rock Island County Board? Yes. I, I, I would put it out there, uh, Porter, if there's an opportunity through invite or request, I think that the County Board uh, would greatly benefit uh, from this conversation uh, because sometimes if we don't bring certain things to bear not that the individuals that are legislators or elected officials are uh, are not aware of what's going on in their in their um, their districts or the spaces that they represent but sometimes certain matters and concerns don't get the attention it rightfully deserves and needs and this one is one that i think uh, deserves more attention, uh, more light on it, so that we could do the best we can to provide uh, solutions uh, to this uh, challenge and provide more partners in the work. So if there are city councils uh, in any of the uh, surrounding area, if you want uh, this type of presentation, please contact them. 
if there are representatives at the state levels and you want this kind of information, uh, please contact them. We're going to have an email that you can reach out to just in a second. Our producer will put it up so that you can connect with them personally and ask faith groups. Um, we would love for you to be more engaged uh, and to learn more. Uh, and are there any other groups that you would like to see uh, or have more opportunities presenting to them? No judgment for the reasons why perhaps there hasn't been there as much in the past, but are there any organizations or institutions or initiatives that you would like to have more of a partnership with? Um, we're just trying to get into more schools right now to give trainings yeah. um, to educate youth on human trafficking. I think that's so important. So any schools, um, Tyler, can you think of any other partners that we are wanting to reach? I think schools are definitely um, the big one. We welcome any community partners who are interested in this work and who want to build that collaborative relationship. Um, and we've been very fortunate to have some great community partners. Great. So to any schools, whether private, parochial, uh, religious, public, uh, if you are in a position to be the decision maker, please reach out to Breaking Traffic. You can see the uh, email address is still there. It's still up. We'll keep it up just for a few more minutes. We want you to get this email address down uh, because we want you to reach out and, and have this quality presentation. Some years ago there, uh, in the recent past, there was a documentary made and that documentary was a eye opener. It's, um, it's, uh, it's long enough to shake the attention. And would you please tell me about that documentary or tell our viewing audience about that documentary and how is it used in some of the presentations? Um, it's called Any Kid Anywhere, and we use it in um, presentations just to show how it does happen in Iowa. And it's um, a few survivor stories that have been brave enough to speak up and do that film. Wow. So the idea of any kid anywhere. So yes. it kind of breaks through that misunderstanding that it's only a certain demographic, certain type of person that and a certain city or a certain size of a state that this is a reality anywhere. Thank you for putting that up. Any kid, anywhere. So that idea of how do we share these resources, that documentary is available to be shown uh, and accompanied by one of the advocates. Uh, am I correct? Yes, um, it can just be Googled if anyone. It's on Vimeo, I believe. Good. So I want the, the viewing audience to please take a look at the documentary. Um, the uh, stories, uh, survivor stories there are so important, but also the information about what's happening here local. Uh, I believe it would be to our collective benefit to take a look at uh, that video. I'm going to uh, actually see if we can schedule a viewing here uh, at Project Now. I'll be uh, calling and I will be calling one of the survivor advocates, to, uh, rather one of the advocates to be with us to talk through it and to have a deep conversation about it afterwards. And uh, hopefully, hopefully that maybe there are individuals that have friends, loved ones, or they themselves have personal stories that can be shared as well because I think it's so uh, important to hear from those that have journeyed. The documentary is gonna present some of that, but I know in some of this work, you never know who is sitting in the audience. And so you just never know. I am so delighted that we had this experience and conversation today. I have just one more round of questions and then we'll uh, come in right on time. Uh, if there, I see, uh, uh, if there is individual, individuals that are looking to, to share this broadcast with others, absolutely take advantage of what we have today as a resource. Uh, um, we essentially have these conversations for the public good. It is to draw awareness. It is to promote uh, the good that is being done in very difficult realities here uh, in the Quad Cities and the region itself. 
how do we expand more partnerships? How do we grow more initiatives that lend itself to justice, uh, the lived experience, and not something that is simply on paper? We are going to continue to think through some of the possibilities in the future, but I want to just go around and and ask you for your, your final thoughts today. Anything that we did not cover that you want to make sure you get out, uh, your final hopes. Um, so about 30, 40 seconds apiece, um, feel free. This is your opportunity because these sessions move so fast. Uh, and what's most important to me that you get a chance to uh, uh, to share personally. Thank you, Don Clark. We see that you have a, a put up the uh, uh, Vimo link there. Thank you so much. So individuals can get a get a chance to to log in and, and check it out for themselves. Uh, let's start with uh, um, let's start with uh, Tyler, and then we'll move to uh, Sarah. Then we'll finish up with Gretchen. Uh, your your thoughts, uh, your final thoughts. Um, any closing thoughts? Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this, um, and I would encourage anyone with an interest or a suspicion to um, seek out further information, whether it's from breaking traffic or whether it's from, um, you know, the National Human Trafficking Hotline has a website um, themselves with a ton of resources or whether it's another community partner. Um, if you see something, say something, it's at least worth a conversation. Um, and we're happy to have those conversations with you. Thank you so much. And how about you, Sarah, your, your thoughts? I know you've been uh, thinking through uh, so many realities coming here now and working in uh, the same mission to break trafficking, uh, to dismantle the system and eradicate uh, any residue of the reality. Your, your final thoughts for us. Yeah, I'm just very grateful, um, grateful that we're having this discussion and grateful for um, the community and everyone that is attending today. And um just together we are better so yeah. thank you for joining in and um being involved in this conversation i love that that phrase together we are better uh, we are indeed getting better because we are working uh more closely together we're learning about each other's mission and we are opening up opportunities for other individuals to join us in the work uh, gretchen your final thoughts uh it's been a lot said today but maybe there's something you want to reiterate, something that you want to present, something that you want to ask of us. Yeah, um, thank you so much for having us again. Um, it is awesome that we're able to talk about the work that we're doing in the community and raising awareness throughout the community. Um, if anyone who's watching can share this and provide education to anyone that you know about what human trafficking is, kind of, um, bust those myths that are out there. Um, and then, like Tyler said, report to the National Human Trafficking Hotline. If you do see anything um, that you feel like needs to be reported, they will get that to our local law enforcement or um, FBI, whoever um, needs to be involved. That will have the ability to trickle down if there is a report made to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, um, or you can report to DHS or DCFS. Um, you can do that anonymously, um, as well as I think it's so important if there's any parents watching to have open conversations with your kids or teens. Um, like Tyler said earlier, how prevalent it is on social media with Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, people are using those um, social media platforms to target teens and um, kids to recruit. Um, there is a website, missingkids.org, that can help aid parents with having discussions with their teens or kids. I know that um, having a discussion about human trafficking can be uncomfortable, but people just need to start getting comfortable being uncomfortable uh, so that we can make a difference. Thank you so much. Uh, is, uh, I'm going to talk just for about a minute more uh, to give an opportunity. There it is. I wanted to make sure that the hotline number made its way to um, the, uh, the airing here. Thank you so much. I wanted to see that number there. We appreciate 
uh, the uh, producers are working very quickly behind the scenes to make sure we get the numbers up so that we can communicate those important numbers. I tell you this, I have been overjoyed uh, with the experience of being able to talk to individuals that are working in such a difficult reality and in hopes of those that are experiencing uh, the, the heart-wrenching, uh, hurtful um, experience of trafficking, that they can be supported, that they can have a different experience, and that life can change. And so I am so happy to have provided just a little time for you to talk at length about what it is that you do and for who. We've talked about the demographics. We've talked about legislation. We've talked about partnerships. We've given out helpful hints and preventive work and intervention work. My sincere hope is that we will continue to do the things that matter uh, because the, the, the challenge of justice being realized is one that we have to pay attention to. Um, Brian Stevenson, who of course is not only an activist, but an extraordinary lawyer and attorney and an author of the book, Just Mercy, he challenges us in our understanding of poverty. He says that the opposite of poverty isn't wealth. Instead, it's justice. And so what we're trying to do is find a way to make sure that we reach justice. And what is justice? It's love dressed in work clothes. So to the entire viewing audience, those that will watch later as well, to Breaking Traffic, to Gretchen, uh, to Sarah, and of course, Tyler, thank you so much for what you do for so many people. We're going to keep our work clothes on because we love people. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. If you have any information that you want to share as a viewing audience with us about this topic, make sure you connect with our team. Uh, we want to make sure we're hearing from you directly. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.